whatever, doesn't matter. Okay, it says that we're recording. Okay. <laughs> welcome, welcome everybody. So I just want to let you guys know what I'm doing. I'm recording this as a YouTube video and also a podcast. And I have an amazing guest with me, Amanda Louder. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Thank you for having me. You are so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Just to tell you a tiny bit about Amanda, and I'm sure she could tell us a little bit more, but she has the podcast Live From Love. Yep. And she is a certified life coach with the Life Coach School. She is a marriage coach, relationship coach, and a sex coach. Yep. And I have learned so much from listening to her podcast. Thank you, Amanda. I like my marriage is already so much better. And <laughs> Good. No, seriously, so I'm here to just discuss stuff that a lot of times in the LDS community, it's not talked about. Right. And that's why I feel like your voice is so important right now. And in the vein of after a divorce, I yeah. think, yeah, I think it's just a topic that needs to be addressed. I have a lot of clients right now that really need to kind of know and be directed as far as where their feelings are matching up with their bodies and mm -hmm. you know, what they're supposed to do. And then in second marriages. So we're going to get to those, those topics. And so, yeah, again, thanks for being here. We're just going to jump right in. Okay. So like I said, you know, we are members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints abstinence is part of the commandments, not having sex until you're married. Yeah. And as you know, cause you've been divorced before and are in a new, new marriage here. Um, it's hard once you've had really it. hard. Yeah. It's really, really hard. You don't yeah. Have it anymore. And so what are some tips you can give to people just in general that are in that space? Yeah. So I think, like, I would just want to acknowledge that it is a really hard part of dating and going into second marriage after you've been divorced. I think it's even harder than when we were when we were teenagers, because now we know what we're missing out on and our bodies kind of just used to going there. And when we have to put on the brakes, it's a lot harder than it used to be. Um, but I really feel like, yes, those are the church's teachings and, but it's up to each individual to decide what they're willing to do and what they're not willing to do and then hold yourself accountable to that make that decision ahead of time where that line is going to be mm -hmm. for you mm -hmm. i think making heavenly father part of that decision asking him for help for you to stay true to your integrity whatever that is um also being understanding that we're human <laughs> Yes. And we make mistakes and that is exactly what the atonement is for. So making him part of um, the sexual relationship that you have with yourself mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. um, whatever that looks like for you. For me personally, my temple covenants were the most important thing to me. Mm -hmm. And I was not willing to lose the ability to be able to go to the temple and find peace and answers. Mm -hmm. So luckily my husband um, felt the same way. So we did our best to try and help keep each other strong when one of us was weak. Um, yeah. But a couple of rules that we kind of made for ourselves were that, so um, he, I was living with my parents, but he owned a home. And so we made the rule that we would never be home alone together mm -hmm. that we would always have either our kids there or friends there or my parents there or whatever that we were not going to be home alone at a home together mm -hmm. um we made sure that we were never laying down while we were kissing mm -hmm. we kept our hands on top of clothing we made mm -hmm. sure to never touch each other under clothing or over clothing like where we shouldn't be so those were just kind of some rules that we discussed Mm -hmm. It wasn't just my hard and fast. It was like, okay, this, you know, we don't want to get into trouble here. So what do we want to do together mm -hmm. to help each other and support each other? And, you know, just little things like that to have that safety net in place. Um, I think it's really up to the individual though, where that line is for them. 
Yes. And I love that you talked about as a couple, you know, with whomever you're dating, the communication is so important. So important. Okay. Yeah. Hey, this is my personal thing. This is what I'm doing. Um, I'd love for you to be on board with that. This is my boundary, you know, yeah. then holding to that. Yeah. And so holding to that. And then, you know, if, if you're communicating that and your whoever you're dating or whatever is not okay with that, then that also warrants a discussion. And, you know, yeah. maybe that's not the right person that you want to be dating. If they're going to continually push your boundaries, then they probably don't have enough respect for you to honor those. That's a big indicator. Yeah. And in that same vein, so here's a scenario okay. that I see a lot. Um, we have intimacy issues. Maybe in a first marriage, their wife never wanted to have sex with them. Maybe there, it was sex less. Yeah. Maybe it was a huge, huge problem. Maybe they never felt connected. They never felt, you know, vibing together. And so now they're in a dating relationship and they say, Hey, I'm sorry. You know, I, I think we belong to a couple of the same, um, divorce Facebook groups or whatever, yeah. where, where we saw someone say, I am going to have sex before yes. married because I want to ensure yeah. this. So what do you, what's your advice there? Do you think you have to have sex before marriage to know if you're sexually compatible or not? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I truly believe that we can be sexually compatible with just about anyone. If there's an attraction and a chemistry there, if you're both willing to work on it. Mm -hmm. So, which means it needs to have more open communication and trust. Mm -hmm. It means both parties need to be able to discuss openly how they feel about sex, what they believe about it, what they are and aren't willing to do. And I would be hesitant to pursue any relationship further if those things weren't in line with each other. Um, they also need to be able to communicate, both of you need to be able to communicate your insecurities about it, be yes. willing to be open and vulnerable and be able to talk about that. If we can't talk about that, like how is a marriage going to work? But if you can be fully open and vulnerable with each other and communicate well, then you can have a beautiful sexual relationship, no matter who the person is. Yes. And I think we're, we're together on that. It, it, there's so much you can learn just from an emotional relationship in an intimate way yes. about someone who's kind and patient with you and caring to know how they will be in yes. a more physical way. Yeah. So you can yeah. see those, those parallels. Yeah. So my, so my husband was coming from a relationship that, um, there wasn't a lot of intimacy. Mm -hmm. Mine was completely the opposite. That was probably like the one part of our relationship that worked. <laughs> so, but he and I had so many conversations, like, you know, he would say, do you even like sex? I'm like, yes, I love sex. Sex mm -hmm. is great. And he's like, okay, that's good. And I'm like, well, you know, what's your perspective? And since we've been married, there are definitely things that we've had to work through from those insecurities and baggage that we bring in from the other relationships. But because we are willing to be open and vulnerable and communicate about that with each other, we can work through anything. Yes. And sex changes too. Totally. It's super good at the beginning. And you could think, okay, we're compatible. And then 10 years down the road, maybe hormonally, what, whatever. Yeah changes kids that way that's why communication and what you're saying is more important absolutely and i find it interesting so recalling that post that we both saw in the facebook group you know my question to her was what problem do you think you're going to be able to prevent by having sex beforehand and what if it doesn't work Right. Like if you're going to go out and have sex and like, oh, well, that didn't work. Okay. Now I just had sex with someone that I'm never going to be married to. That's probably not a good idea. Right. Right. And, and my, my answer to that was the discipleship that yes. our discipleship um, and our devotion to Jesus Christ, it will, it will outweigh and it will protect and it will with trust. And it's hard because there's no trust right now, you know, right. Right. And you know, what, it, how, what are you saying that like, I don't know if I can trust you to have a sexual relationship with you and a marriage with you if we can't have sex beforehand. Yeah. Right. 
that's a good point. Well, and so now we're left with a mid single, you know, for who knows how long, you know, dating, yeah. you can get married really quickly, or you could go years and years. So it's not just, you know, we're learning in high school mm -hmm. and we're virgins for a little bit and then we get married. No, there's an issue that abounds with the mid single group going without sex and our, and our bodies are made for sex. Yeah. And so there's a loneliness. Just quickly, I wanted to read a couple of lines from a, a pretty cool blog that I ran into called Exponent 2. And it's, it says the different sides of single and chaste. She says, I'm tired of the word virgin being tied to ideas like naive, simple, scared, fragile, and ashamed. So obviously, this is a, a decision she's made in this firm, in it, firm on and wants it to be empowering and noble. But... And I'll just paraphrase, she goes on to say, hey, this is super lonely. My body is frustrated. Yeah. So what advice or what can you add to that feeling of loneliness, but at the same time wanting to nobleize virginity? Yeah. You know, there's nothing going to be the same as being able to share your life with a partner and being able to be intimate with that. There's nothing that we can do outside of that that's going to you know perfectly fill that within us but i think there are things like not isolating ourselves mm -hmm. surrounding ourselves with friends and family to realize that you do have people around you that you aren't alone um we often crave that intimate touch so you know what can we do to get that intimate touch without it being sexual a great um response to that i've seen and witnessed and heard and stuff is like getting massages on a regular basis where you're being touched all over but it's in a non-sexual way but it helps fill that need in you yes. um the biggest thing though i think is developing a sexual relationship with yourself and your own sexuality mm -hmm. determining what the law of chastity means for you what you're willing to do discuss it with the lord bring him into that relationship and that decision and then go forward from there mm -hmm. That's good advice. Um, and there's something to, even though there is a, a level of suffering, but there is something transcendent about being faithful to covenants that can yeah. get you through that and on a different plane of happiness too. Totally. So totally. now let's get on, you know, we talked just a little bit about dating. Let's get on to second marriages. Okay. So um, in the LDS kind of community, I've seen a lot of times, you know, with the failed, and I don't like using that term, but the first marriage that didn't work out, we can learn from failure. It's fine. Yes. But, so it didn't work out. A lot of times people are young. They come in, you know, they're, so, so the second marriage intimacy for me, at least, and many of my friends is so much better. Yeah. Why, why do you think? Well, I think we were young, most of us, when we got married for this first time. We didn't understand intimacy. We didn't understand sex. We didn't understand our bodies. So hopefully with a second marriage, we've done a lot more work on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we understand ourselves as it relates to sex and intimacy a lot better. So that when we can fully share that part of ourselves with someone else, it bodes a lot better for a second marriage. We have a better understanding of what we like and what we don't like, and we can better advocate for ourselves as well. Right. I love what you just said about knowing yourself. Yeah. Things that you've so so, and this is not part of the questions, Amanda. But what That's could okay. what could you tell an individual then that it's never been married, who may be young? I think it's the same thing. You get to know yourself. Yes. You get to know yourself. You have a good relationship with yourself. You understand who you are as an individual, how your body works, how your sexuality works, all of the ins and outs of your personality, where your insecurities lie and look really, you know, hold up a mirror to yourself. Like, what am I not seeing? Right. Right. Even understanding the basic physiology. Totally. You know, and, and you, I think you have podcasts about that where women don't even know what is what. So right. go, go check yeah. out the podcast on that. 
Yes, <laughs> absolutely do that. <laughs> so now, not all second marriages have this great intimacy. And I'm not saying that it's just automatically great. I'm just saying, you know, the, the, yeah. on a general level, you know more about yourself, you're more comfortable, but there's some that it's actually worse. Maybe in their first marriages, this was borderline abuse or some are. Mm -hmm. And so now sex is a trigger. So yeah. two questions here. What could you say to the individual who mm -hmm. has the problem, has the trigger centered around sex? And then what would you say to their partner? So for the individual, I would say that you need to seek professional help, whether that's through a coach who's trained in this or um, or a therapist to really work through those triggers and help you understand what's going on mentally so that you aren't triggered anymore. Um, for the partner who is with them, I would say be supportive and empathetic. And if you have a partner who, you know, is being triggered and having issues and they don't want to see someone about it, um, I think putting some appropriate pressure on the relationship in order to do that, you know, offer to go with them, whatever they need, but yeah. saying like, you know, this isn't working and I love you and I want to stay married to you. So we need to get this figured out. I love that. I love that term appropriate pressure. Yeah, that's good. And any, in any problem that you see. Totally. It. Now, yeah. Amanda, I know that you could speak for days about this topic and I could listen for days and that's what I do with your <laughs> podcast, but give us just some final tips, five to 10, you know, tips on better intimacy in, in either a first or second or whatever marriage you're on. Okay. So first thing, number one, work on yourself, your issues, your hangups, your anxieties. We can more fully give ourselves to our partner when we work on ourselves first. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that you have to be perfect. It just means that you acknowledge where you are and it, you continue to work on those things. Mm -hmm. um, number two, direct your thoughts towards sex and intimacy throughout your day on purpose. Mm -hmm. Many times, especially as women, we think, oh, I'm just not in the mood. But really, we haven't been cultivating that desire and connection within ourselves. And we need to do that on purpose. Mm. It doesn't just come out of nowhere uh, for most of us anyway. Um, number three is understand that we create our own happiness. It is not our partner's job to make us happy. In fact, it's not even possible. <laughs> okay. Right. Right. Our happiness is dependent on how we choose to think. So choose to create that happiness for yourself and bring that to the relationship. Mm. Um, number four, be confident in who you are right now. Not like, oh, I can be confident if I do this or if I weigh this or I look like this, mm -hmm. but be confident in who you are right now. Confidence is the sexiest thing that you can do. Yes. And number five is to drop all expectations for your spouse and just choose to love them for them. Mm. That's when I continuously work on <laughs> we all do <laughs> so true you know I always say the phrase trade expectations for appreciation yes and that can go a long way absolutely well Amanda we could keep talking but I purposefully wanted to make this a little bit short and and have my listeners just taste a little bit of what um, Amanda Louder has to say <laughs> on the intimacy topic. And so everybody go check her out. Live from love podcast, amandalouder.com. Is that right? Yep. That's right. Okay. I just want to make sure. And if you have any questions, you can of course email me coach Emily Sanchez at Gmail simple. So make it a great, make it a great day guys. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Okay.